Good morning or good afternoon or good evening to wherever you are uh, and welcome to today's Theatre Art Life discussion with Neil Gooding. Neil, welcome to Theatre Art Life and thank you for joining us. Oh, thanks a lot. Looking forward to it. Wonderful. Before we get started, guys, uh, for those who are uh, not familiar with the uh, our platform. I just want to give you a few housekeeping rules. Um, on the right, please introduce yourselves from wherever you are um, and say hello. You can ask questions anytime you like in the chat box on the right. If for any reason you drop out, you can log back anytime via the email link. And if you can't hear us, don't worry, log back out, log back in again. Uh, and a replay is available if you have sketchy internet. So it'll be sent to you personally 24 hours after this session. So, uh, that is just some housekeeping for you guys. And before we get started with chatting with Neil, I'm going to show you a bit of his, uh, a bit or it's his showreel, <laughs> and uh, show you some of the work that he has produced and been involved in uh, around the around the world. So take a look. Thou esteems the ornament of life, yet live a coward in thine own esteem, letting I dare not wait upon I would, like the poor cat in the adage, to the pigs. It's been one of the traffic since you went away, and I miss you so much from counting down the days. Only funny three nights until I see your face, just an ordinary day in a life of Bunch of great stuff in there, Neil. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's funny looking back at stuff like that and going, oh, yeah, all those things happened. <laughs> <laughs> I want to get on to Back to the Future, but uh, the musical, because I would have loved to have seen that, love that movie. But um, to get started, before we start talking about what you're doing now, I know you're in New York and, um, yeah. and what you're currently working on. Just tell us a little bit about how you got into producing, directing and writing for, for the entertainment industry. Um, so I, I grew up in a, a really small town in, in North Queensland in Australia um, and sort of uh, we had this luxury in a 10,000 person town of having a 530 seat theatre, which is crazy. So like 5% of the population can sit on any one night. Uh, and my parents were involved there as, as uh, on the theatre board and, you know, as volunteer ushers. So I, I essentially just grew up in that theatre and saw everything that came through town for, for you know, 15 years. Um, and that kind of led to many debates when I was going off to university where I said to my parents, well, I want to be an actor. And they were going, well, you're going to go and do university. So I did, went and did law commerce. And um, during that time, I was doing four or five theatre shows a year. So my, my law marks were, you know, adequate to pass. <laughs> and, but, I was doing, <laughs> but I was doing um, a, a lot of theatre shows. So I kind of um, had, had seen every facet of theatre, like from backstage to being on it. Then I moved to Sydney determined to be an actor when I was uh, 20, 20 and um, had a very unillustrious acting career but ended up working for Jacobson's at the same time who at the time had Beauty and the Beast running in Sydney 
And, and that really set off this pathway where I've always had this juggle between do I want to be um, on the producing financial side of theatre or directing and creative? And I think I've managed to juggle both most of the time. The, the mix is never perfect. Like mm. every, time I'm, every time I'm deep in the weeds with producing something, I'm always looking at something else going, oh, I'd love to just be directing <laughs> and in a room with actors doing that. And then every time I'm doing just the act, the, the, the directing stuff, I, I'm being pulled another way to direct. So it's never, it's never a neat balance. I, the, the sweet spot really came for me when we set up the Hayes Theatre in Sydney, which I was the, the founding chairman of, where it's a controllable size theatre where you can, you can logistically produce and direct shows and keep them exactly the way you want them. And if they succeed, you got on stage what you wanted. If they, if they don't succeed, there's nobody to blame. You just have to go well. Well, I, you know, it's not like I can blame my my producers that wouldn't spend the money, or my or my creative team that didn't do what I thought. So, so yeah, that's always been the juggle between those those things for me. Um, it seems to work out reasonably well, but but everybody always wants a producer more than there's you know, eighty percent of the time my phone rings is to be producing something for somebody. It's not it's not people going, hey, come and direct this show for us. So, yeah. yeah. And how did you get then, because you've done some stuff in the UK, right? So how did you branch beyond Australia for, for that work? Uh, it, it really all comes down to your network of connections and, and who you know. So, um, in fact, that one goes back way, way. That, that's probably the, the, the biggest takeaway from any of these talks I do about theatre now. Is it's, it's all about who you work with and make sure you get on with people. So the, the real answer for that is that when I first got to Sydney, I had done a show, a tiny show in, in Brisbane with this guy called Daniel Sparrow. And when I got to Sydney, Daniel was working for Jacobson's on Beauty and the Beast and he got me the job on Beauty and the Beast. And he has been in London for years. And the first show I did in London was Holding the Man. I was one of the co-producers of that. And Daniel was the lead producer of that. And he was looking to raise money and get co-producers on board. And so he called me. And so, again, these, these contacts that go back 20 years, suddenly you go... That's how all these pieces slot together. And then, you know, once you do one show in London, you meet other producers and you, you get to know more people. And same in mm. New York. Everybody kind of intersects at some point. Um, and everybody is always raising money. So. Yeah. And in Australia, you know, in relative terms to New York and the UK is a relatively small industry. So is it harder to raise money for, for shows in Australia? Um, yeah, I... I I think to some extent it is, which is why so much of our money now comes from overseas. Um, mm. You know, I think as, as we, because we inherit a lot of, a lot of um, international shows, I think some of that comes with a lot of international money as well. Um, and Australia just also doesn't have the, the generations of wealth that, that New York has and that, that even London has. And also that, that idea that, uh, investing in theatre is something to do with your money. I, I think Australia is, has a really great philanthropic, like our, our, the wealthy Australians are great donors largely to the ballet companies and the opera mm. companies. And the, the, um, But I don't know that they cross over as much into the idea that, well, we could also put money into Shrek, the musical. S some do, um, mm. but it's not as common there. And it's certainly, uh, and Australia is still also in the zone that, I mean, I've got to say I pr prefer ethically, but where investors are investors. They're not co-producers. They're not, they're not billed. Uh, whereas, you know, obviously London and the USA have gone down this pathway of having 40 names above the title, um, which is, you know, is not horrible, but it, it is confusing because quite often right. you have, um, you know, people that have won four Tony Awards, legitimately won them because they, they're a co-producer, but they actually have never been the lead producer or, or don't really know how the show that they worked on is actually logistically produced. Um, so that's one ongoing battle that I, that I find a lot is that uh, a lot of people have won Tonys that may or may not actually know how to put a theatre show together. Right. So they've just sort of been done it in a big gang of people as part of a, a bigger group. Yeah, and they, and, they raised, and they raised they raised money and they did things that are very useful and very necessary, but it's not raising money is not the only part of being a, a creative producer. Yeah. And what are some of the other differences between the UK and Australia and US that you'd sort of say from your level of work? 
Uh, well, the main reason I moved to New York is just the the ability because I, I feel like I spent ten or fifteen years um, setting up New Musicals Australia and setting up the Hayes and developing a lot of new Australian musicals and shows. Um, but that's a tricky pathway in Australia. We, it's, it's very badly funded, largely, uh, particularly for musicals, and there's no real pathway for how you grow a show into its season at the Hayes and then after the Hayes, where do you take it to? That mm. is much, much more complex and mature in the USA. And, and, you know, and every new show, by the time we inherit in Australia, it's easy to forget that Wicked and Book of Mormon and Dear Evan Hansen, that they were new shows in New York that were written and developed and workshopped and out of town tryout and somebody puts up the risk and you don't know whether it's going to work or not. So that's just a much more um, intricate and mature process in America that um, excites me because that's kind of what I feel like I do. It it excites me less these days to get the rights for an existing show and to put it on in Australia. I'd much rather be developing new shows and and Mm. growing those. And how do you how do you choose shows? Like what 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 are you looking for when you're when you're trying to pick something that you're going to produce? Uh, it really depends uh, whether it's an idea that I'm creating from scratch by myself, or whether I'm being bought by writers, for example, or whether I'm being bought by other producers. So it's a really subjective thing for me, and it shifts from time. I mean, the first thing is you you really have to love the people you're working with it on. You're about you're about to get into a a marriage with them for the next, <laughs> you know, could, could, could be the next decade. And so you go, you have to know that you really like the people and that you have a, a language that allows you to debate and argue and disagree if needed and to do that respectfully and all for the purposes of making the show the best version of the show that you can. Mm. Uh, with writers, that means you need to know that they are not only hugely talented, but they are, they are collaborative. They do want feedback. They know how to stand their ground when they need to stand their ground and they know how to give room when they need to give room and compromise. Mm. Uh, And then then the the, the subject material, I don't really have a, like it's not like I would sit there and go, it has to be a comedy, it has to be this. It's very much show by show and whether the the subject material and the the size of the show fits the ambition. So if someone brings me a, a small show that I and they say this has to go to Broadway when it clearly is never going to be Broadway, but it could be a big off-Broadway hit or it could tour, you know, the regions. Um, yeah, I, I think my work has been fairly varied over the years. Mm. And, and, I, and, and like I said, it does change. Like my, my natural instinct as a producer and, and certainly as a director is a bit smaller and a bit darker and a bit grittier. Um, mm. And I feel like, prior to a marriage separation and all the things that can, and having children, all the things that can impact you financially, I was able to take a lot of risks in Australia um, because I, I wrote a show called Back to the 80s when I was 23 that sort of performed around the world. And that royalty stream allowed me to go, well, if I, if I love this show and I want to put it on, even if I think it will never recoup, then that's something stupid I can do with those royalties. Um, <laughs> and, as li- and as life changes and now that I've hit my 40s and have other responsibilities, I'm now in a zone where I go, I have to choose the shows knowing that I have investors now, which I didn't used to to have. And even if I artistically love a show, if I think that show has no audience and no way of recouping, right Mm. now in my zone of life, I go, I just have to love it from afar and wish it good luck (laughs) and not put money into that. Whereas something like Back to the Future pops up and I go, well, that makes commercial sense. It's being artists. I, I mean, I, I'm not at a phase of my life also where I'm going to go, I don't care about artistry and about creative. I, 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 I just can't get to a point where I go, as long as it's going to make money, I don't care what it is. I, I, I yeah. will never hit that zone. But, but it's more the reverse. It's more the things I go, oh, God, I love the writing of that show and I love the director and I love what they're trying to do. But then I go, I think there's about seven people in the world that want to see that show, which means I just can't produce it right now. Yeah. I'm hoping in 10 years from now I get back to a financial p- point where I go, now I've got my slush fund and I'm going to go back and support yeah. just the things that I love the most artistically, regardless of whether they make money or not. So Yeah. Well, that's the ideal position to be in, isn't it? But it is a, yeah. a super big responsibility, I think, you know, especially because you're putting on content um around the world and you're producing stuff and 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 so for example in australia 
you know, people may go see a musical or a theatre show once a year and you're choosing, you know, what that might be. And so do you feel like that that comes with a sense of responsibility from a cultural perspective? Uh, no, I, to, to some extent I think that comes with a sense of responsibility to make right decisions for what the audience may want to see for your investors. Because I, I do sort of feel like that artistic responsibility um, particularly in Australia, but I, I, would just, I think it's the same here, is that would be more my brief if I was the head of Sydney Theatre Company or if I right. was running, um, you know, uh, Bell Shakespeare or Bangara, where I go, where it's a not-for-profit organisation that is there to push the boundaries of an art form and to to sort of drive a country forward artistically. Mm-hmm. Um, commercial pro- Now, ironically, I do think commercial productions should be doing that as well and have a role to do that. But it is, it is less of a consideration to me to go, I need to be breaking the genre apart, and particularly in Australia where we're, our, our palette for shows really is we import Wicked, we import Book of Mormon, we import, you know, Harry Potter. So uh, the audience's appetite is less broad on the big scale. Mm. Uh, and that's where something like The Haze popped up and was really interesting, and that's why we set it up, because you go, that's where you can do all this off-Broadway stuff that does sort of push the boundaries a little bit of musical theatre, but on a much more controllable scale. Level. So, so yeah, I, I think I've got my internal compass on what I think is good art and not good art, and um, but I, I don't view it necessarily as my duty to the GP to present them yeah. to present them with what, only what I think is, you know, what, the, what I think they should be, what's worthy of watching. But having mm. said that, I mean, one of the other reasons I'm in New York is, I mean, it's a, it's a really interesting time over here because um, if you look at the last decade of Tony Awards, they're going to shows like Dear Evan Hansen, Hamilton, Band's Visit, Hades Town. I mean, they're not obvious commercial hits. There's, it's not like they're, they're picking Pretty Woman the musical and Rocky the yeah. musical and going, that's a so, – so we are in this really interesting phase for, for me personally where – Shows that I love, like Come From Away, a, a, a Dog Fight, all these kind of smaller shows that are much more like plays with music or and much more character driven, they are actually becoming commercial hits mm. in New York. And that's a fascinating thing for me and why I'm here. Whether or not they can become commercial hits around the world, like it, it's hard to see the band's visit playing a successful season in Sydney. It, it might, right. but it's, yeah. but it's, and even Hades town, it's not an obvious show to go to Sydney, but, but there is that genre of show in New York over the last, or even 20 years where you get spring awakening and next to normal and stuff where that fun home, where those kind of shows are commercial hits here. They may mm. not be around the rest of the world, but that, that's fascinating to me because that's, yeah. that, that, that all of those shows are changing the shape of musical theater. They're not, they're not, crassly commercial um you know properties and, and and i sort of argue with people anyway about this idea that musical theater is this kind of it's all sequins and feathers and everybody's dancing I, I i kind of say to everyone that impression of musicals i know why it exists and, and i know it's sort of people use it to denigrate musicals a bit but i go if you take out things like 42nd street and anything goes i go the, the top the, the most famous 15 or 20 musicals in the world are Les Miserables and Phantom of the Opera and West Side Story. And I go, mm. none of those shows remotely look like this impression that people have of musicals where everybody's just dancing. And, <laughs> exactly. and you know, got, got the, 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 and I, I go, so it's actually a, a misnomer anyway that musicals don't deal with, you know, Phantom of the Opera is a pretty gritty show on some of Les Mis certainly is. West Side Story certainly is in its era. You go, they yeah. deal with social issues and they deal with tough topics and they tackle, you know, they hold a mirror up to in society in, in the way that any great, you know, piece of theatre does. Um, you know, I'm, I don't think that Mamma Mia necessarily does that, but that is just there to entertain. But, yeah. but you know, the, the, most of the, the most famous musicals in the world, they're not these light-hearted pieces of fluff. They're pretty... They have resonance. Pretty gritty. Yeah, and even going yeah. right back to the Rogers and Hammerstein stuff with South Pacific and Sound of Music, and, and you know they feel like these light-hearted musicals. You go, they're fundamentally not. If you look at South Pacific, <laughs> it's it's not, you know, it's not a uh, 
an issue free musical. Mm, exactly, exactly. So in the, you're in the the USA right now, and you're you're in New York. And so, what are you doing now? Given the fact that obviously Broadway shut down, and you're navigating COVID like the rest of us, what's happening? Yeah. Well, ironically, so my show, I have a show that will go off Broadway in New York uh, whenever that's allowed to open. But ironically, having now come back here and having quarantined, going to Australia, coming back here, I am now spending all of my time pretty much working on a show called Drummer Queens, which is going on back in Australia in February. Uh, so I'm in completely the wrong time zone for all, for all my uh, for all my phone calls and stuff. So five o'clock in the afternoon in New York starts nine a.m. in Sydney, and then suddenly my right. day kind of erupts at the moment. Um, and that's just a factor of th- that Australia has done a very good job of controlling coronavirus and is reopening its theatres. Um, and, you know, like like all producing, you kind of look for the the avenue that allows you to have an opportunity to put a show on in a certain place at a time that works. And so so right now that, that is Australia. Um, mm. And then hopefully with the vaccine, like New York can start opening up because, I mean... An, there's, there's not much control on the number of cases in the USA at the moment. So it, it's going to need the vaccine or something like that to, to, to get this back under control to a point where theatres could even consider reopening. Mm. And so with your work in New York, then you, you're looking, you're just waiting until that's under control before you start kicking into gear for any shows over there? Or? Uh, well, no, you sort of need to be able to, to lay down the railroad tracks to allow, because once theatres are allowed to open, you need to have been prepared for the show to go in. So, so there's some elements of that that you, you can do, which is work with writers to finalise the, the writing of the script. And you can do workshops and, and get things up to date. You can do your artwork, get your key art ready. Um, you can even, on some level, have your lawyers drawing up investment documents and raising money, um, you know, talking through potential marketing campaigns. What, what gets hard is knowing without a starting point, um, is, is you know, how do you contract your creatives and how do you get them doing any designs? How do you sensibly work out when you're going to build your set and how it's going to get delivered? So so I feel like this kind of all the preparation for a show can be done, but none of the actual press the green yeah. button and, and, and here we go with the, the other elements that we'll see it onto stage. Yeah. You want them to give you like a three or four month heads up before the theatre's open so you can be ready. <laughs> yeah. And, and if, if you can learn anything from Australia... Uh, we may or may not get that. So, for example, in Queensland uh, a few weeks ago, there was an announcement made by the state government on a Friday afternoon that the theatres that had been sitting at 50% capacity were allowed to go to 100% capacity on the Monday morning the following week. Wow. So th- this idea that the government understands our business model and will be <laughs> in great contact with theatre producers and theatre owners and stuff and that they'll sort out this pathway that's really sensible. I mean, I would imagine that's going to be more coordinated in New York, but certainly you can learn a little bit from Australia and go, it may not be quite as, it may not be quite as coordinated as people think. And even though it's amazing that Queensland is able to move to 100% capacity so quickly, it's tricky to run a theatre to suddenly find out on a Friday that the shows you have on next week that are sold at 50% could actually be 100% or as a producer to go, well, I can't sell tickets to the show for next week anymore. So it's just yeah. those things. But, I mean, we would certainly take that kind of um, government announcement rather than the opposite, which is... Yeah, <laughs> yeah, further shutdowns. And do you think, though, with, with Broadway, I mean, generally maybe it depends on when you're producing, but do you think people are going to be a little bit gun-shy to, to put all the shows back on quickly or do you think um, it's going to be a slow oh. return? That's a really interesting question in New York because I think that's going to be show by show and theatre by theatre um, simply because so much of New York's audience is is tourist-based. Uh, I think it's on average about 70%, uh, a large chunk of which comes from uh, Americans not living in New York and then mm. a huge chunk also comes from international tourists. There is no indication at the moment that tourism is returning to New York anytime soon. So, So I think that's where you... Producers will have to make a decision to be going, what's our local, or say something like Wicked or something like Book of Mormon or Lion King. They're hugely popular, but their actual New York audience is pretty small because they've been running for so long. So mm. if you're from New York, you've, you've seen those shows. and you so, so newer shows may have a slightly easier pathway because they may pick up that first bit of an audience that is New York-based. Um, 
in and then and then that changes in Australia where I, I think what we're seeing in Australia, particularly Sydney, is this overcorrection that everyone's been sitting around for nine months, which shows either backlogged or planning new shows. And uh, I think what's happened in Sydney in particular is that almost every theatre and every theatre company, they're running to a musical to start. So my fear in Sydney is that we're about to be swamped by so much product um, that we don't really know how robust the audience is at the moment and whether mm. they want whether they want to go back into theatres, whether they feel like economically they can afford to go back to theatres. Uh, and that's going to be tested out pretty solidly in Australia because there is about to be more shows around Australia in the next year, uh, partly based on government funding that's coming out that has allowed producers to, to roll their shows out, partly based on, like I said, just every producer scrambling for theatres once they're opening. But the end result may be that there may be too many shows and, and I guess we'll find out. Some, some will still do really well some ways. It's no different to most normal times where everything's competitive. You never get yeah, of course. To, to, to produce a show. But but I, I would say certainly somewhere like Sydney is about to have an unprecedented number of musicals in the next six months. Uh, wow. At both, the big, at both the biggest scale and then also, interestingly enough, um, in this small to medium-sized musical that, that didn't really exist that much before we sort of, you know, pe people were doing, including myself, were doing bits and pieces at various venues and I think the haze helped to sort of centralise that a little bit and so we have this sort of version of off broadway but but it's about to be in like you know, the seymour center is about to have two shows and darlinghurst theater has stuff going the haze has it's coming out that uh the opera house is doing rent uh stc is doing wow. home so you go there's just there's just so much product about to come out that <laughs> I, I don't really know i don't really know how that plays out to be honest well hopefully uh the sydney community and surrounds have been uh so locked down they're ready to spend some money on a few tickets not just not just one for the year <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the hope, and I'm sure that will be the case. But I also, I also worry that, you know, um, you don't need to run back to a theatre to be social. So I kind of, I, I might, my, my theory to a few producers over here has been, yes, people want to socialise, but that doesn't mean they're necessarily going back to a theatre. Like I can, mm. I can go to a to a pub with my ten best friends with a hundred dollars each, and we can have an amazing week, <laughs> or we can all go to Lion King and spend a hundred dollars on one ticket for two and a half hours, and that's the, so. I, I don't. I don't know. I'm, I'm not. And and I think we're going to be testing what happens when everybody's been locked away at home for a long time, and they've had amazing free content on HBO and Netflix and mm. and all those things for for nine months. I I think theatre's going to have to be really good to entice people back into a theatre show. Uh, if you're going to be better than Ozark and you're going to be better than The Crown and you're going to be, you, you have to be really good. And, and yeah. And, you know, um, and that's not a bad thing. I think, but but we'll we'll see whether there's some fatigue from people that are just happier to stay at home now and spend almost no money to be entertained for hours rather than go out. I, I don't really know. I mean, I do think yeah, I mean, live theatre will, live theater will always have its place. There's always going to be mm. live theatre and that entertainment experience. I think it's just going to be that recalibration of how quickly do people come back to the theatres? Mm. How much are they prepared to spend to go and sit in that theatre? Because I, I suspect that will decrease from where it was particularly in new york i mean the the kind of average ticket prices we were seeing before the pandemic i i can't imagine at least in the short to medium term when it reopens that across the board shows are going to be able to charge that kind of money yeah. um but and, then how are also, they going to make and what how, people, and what do, so go ahead oh sorry oh so, but and how and are they going to make what money do people want to see oh well that that's a good question i mean this is the problem is that you know i guess there's big discussions that are happening and need to happen between equity in America and theatre owners and the Broadway League and producers because if ticket prices drop down significantly, uh, then logically your cost base can't be where it was prior to the shutdown. Um, yeah. And that seems to be a, a tricky sticking point here because I don't think theatre owners want to take less rent and I don't think equity wants cast members or crew members or orchestra members to be paid less money. And I don't think marketing companies want to be paid less for their services. And I don't think general managers. So nobody wants to, nobody wants to give up money. But across the board, I think everybody's going to have to take some sort of haircut. Because yeah. at the end of the day, if, if, if the audience is lower and ticket price is lower, then something has to give. No, sure. I, I, don't, I don't really know what that is. So. Yeah. And you were saying, I think the last point you were saying is what do people want to see to get them off the couch, I guess, right? 
<laughs> yeah, because we're in a really tricky zone. I mean, there's, there's big debates going on in previous economic downturns and previous depressions and previous, like, is it, do people just want to see comedy? Do they want to go back and turn their brains off and see a musical that they don't have to think about? Or do they actually want some gritty, you know, emotional theatre? Uh, and that's further complicated by the fact that during this shutdown, the world has gone through the Black Lives Matter movement and, you know, the Me Too movement is not, is, is not that far back. So there's already a, a rebalancing of all of these these things and, and certain shows that may have looked like a guaranteed winner two two years ago may now have either um, you know racial or cultural problems within their script or or mm-hmm. not be the right so so it's, it's actually a very tricky time to try and predict what the general public audience wants um, mm. because I think with as an industry we, we're very clear that we, we do want to be correcting our, you know, our, the imbalances of our, of our BIPOC population and uh, even of the, the, the gender imbalance that is, exists in theatre. Uh, mm. It's just a case of how we take the audience with us because if we produce all shows that we want to do as an industry and the audience would rather see Annie, then, um, then that's a tricky problem for a little while. Yeah. It's fascinating, though, too, isn't it? Because it's really uncharted territory for somebody who may have been producing for years. You've just hit this new speed bump of like, okay, over this speed bump, we don't know what it's going to be, you know. Yeah, and we've seen some of this fallout in Australia. So we've seen the cancellation of Hedwig and the Angry Inch because the lead actor uh, was one of Australia's sort of better-known TV performers who was a commercially really good choice, uh, but he's not a transgender performer. And so this backlash on social media largely um, led to the Sydney festival and the producer canceling that show or postponing it. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know, I don't know what that means for, you know, cause, cause I think a lot of shows may well be in the firing line for, for a lot of things in the next few years. And um, it's, it's going to be tricky. It's something we all need to be conscious of. And it's something that we should, I think we should be ideologically embracing anyway, but it's a mm. case of, whether or not you can just click your fingers and 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 solve all these things overnight is is a a very big question that is going to be tricky. And I, sure. and I think we again, if Australia and this Hedwig and the Angry Inch thing is any guide, I think there's going to be a lot of pressure on every production uh, from all sorts of quarters <laughs> to to um to get this right. But ironically, though, that that at the moment, I don't think that's the audience demanding that. That's that's all sorts of other powers that be and and um. I, I guess the audience will decide what they want to watch and for their own reasons. You know, so. mm, yeah. And have you got anything in the works in the UK or are you busy with Australia and USA right now? So I've got, um, I'm a co-producer on Back to the Future that was basically closed two days after it opened in, in Manchester. Uh, and that has been announced to go into the West End for May. So that's, um, you know, that, that as a co-producer, that's not one of the the shows that I'm driving along in my own sense that it sort of happens and I get notifications but but uh so my life is split between this these two kinds of shows one is where I am the lead producer in American terms on it but you know it's something that I that I drive from the start and I put it together and it's my baby and and I make all the decisions and then mm-hmm. other ones like back to the future where I just uh hitch a lift on somebody else's ride and, and, <laughs> and, and you know and, and raise money and 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 do that so so that that's in May, which is really exciting because I, I didn't even get to Manchester to see it. I was opening Bridges of Madison County in Sydney, and then the theory was I was supposed to fly back to New York, and then head over to Manchester. But I I, I arrived in New York on the twelfth of March, which is the day that Broadway shut down. So right. So um. So obviously I didn't get to Manchester to see Back to the Future. So so um. Yeah. I mean, hopefully by May, fingers crossed. I mean you know, that London is back to some sort of normality and, and that tourists are back there because, again, Back to the Future is going to rely on a tourist audience long term. It's, mm. it's that kind of show that, you know, it it clearly needs everybody arriving from around the world into London to, to pick their, their three shows and hopefully it's one of those three. And what was the motivation to take it straight to West End rather than putting it back on in Manchester? I think it was always it was always the plan that it was going to go from Manchester to the West End. Uh, mm. It was just it was just the um, the whole Manchester season kind of got trashed by COVID, 
Uh, yeah. So I, th I think it comes down to the, the again finances and how much it would cost to put back into Manchester versus how much does it cost to actually put into London. Uh, it comes down to theatre availability, which is always is certainly in London and, and New York. It's it's and Australia at the moment, having done the juggle with a few of them. Theatre availability and real estate is pretty much the biggest determinant of yeah. when a show will happen where. It's something I find that a lot of young producers, a lot of people don't actually consider that much because they just sort of think you you walk up to a theatre and knock on the door and say, hey, put my <laughs> show on. But um, but that certainly is not the case in London and, and, and New York in particular where there's yeah. a backlog of shows like, like you know, years. You have to wait your turn. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and you need to know the right people and it's, it's the same, same thing as always. Yeah. And Back to the Future is a musical. Is it about, is it like the first movie or is it a combination it's movie of movie number all one. So, mm -hmm. so theoretically, I guess we have, we have two sequels that are up our sleeves. But yeah, um, yeah no, it's, it's, it's basically the first movie on stage. But um, the, the things that really attracted me to it, apart from the fact that it's such a great title, is that a lot of the, um, the team from the film are, are all involved um, mm -hmm. as, as the book writers and things like that. The, the music is being done by Alan Silvestri that is well known for his like film scores like Forrest Gump and those things and Glenn Ballard that, that wrote uh, the, and produced the Jagged Little Pill album with Alanis Morissette. Mm -hmm. So it's got this really great team uh, of people working on it, amazing director. And then the, the thing that really sold me on it was the, the technology on stage is, is you know, I, th I think people have an impression of what they're going to see when they see Back to the Future and there's a set of expectations about what they want. And I yeah. think it matches all those. I don't think that people expected it to be quite so technologically um, spectacular on stage, which is a really nice ace up your sleeve to have to surprise people that, that fundamentally think they're coming to watch another musical, another movie turned into a musical on stage. Yeah. Which is, you know, not new anymore, as we know, but, but at least at least with Back to the Future, I go, well, it's a really great musical. And, and at the heart of it with Back to the Future, it's also essentially a story about relationships between family and it's a generational, mm. you know, how do fathers and sons understand each other or not. There's a whole heap of things in that film that make it popular in the first place because yes, everyone will go, it's about the flying car and it's about the, you know, it's about lightning bolts hitting, you go, yeah, all those things happen. But at the heart of it is like all those great 80s films, really, there was, they, they were much more focused on human characters and their relationships to each other and emotion and then and then dress it up with all this other stuff so yeah it's got it's got a lot of things that really work for it i think it's such an iconic film so yeah i think even just the thought of it being on stage in a live production must will draw people out for sure i would go <laughs> well, you so. i mean I, I, I think there was a bit i think there was a bit of movie to musical fatigue in the world like you can see that with tootsie and pretty woman and and king kong so so it certainly is no nowhere near the guarantee that people think it is that you go we've got this amazing title back to the future um i think the first thing is you have to do it really well mm. um because because the movie fan base like like science fiction people you know people love that have those expectations ownership of it and they and they will be the first people to turn on you if you don't get it right but um yeah so so the, the good thing coming out of manchester was that fan base was very clearly active on social media about how well they thought it satisfied their individual desire for what they wanted it to be. Um, yeah. But, you know, we're, we're entering the phase now where it's like any, any musical. It's, it's a big, expensive musical going to the West End and we will know based on ticket sales, you know, much more so than reviews, based on yeah. ticket sales, is it, is it going to succeed or not commercially? That's probably a bit trickier now than it was a year ago before COVID. Um, mm. So we'll see. I mean, you know, I hope I hope a year from now to go. Yeah, Back to the Future is the massive global hit that we think it probably is. But yeah, it, it, it's like all theaters. Like the night before Wicked opened, who knew whether it was going to be successful or not? The night before Fans for the Opera opened, nobody knew whether that was a hit or not. So any anyone that tells you they know a show is going to be a hit or a flop, I mean, I think you can. I think you can know some shows that are going to be flops. <laughs> I don't. I don't, think, <laughs> I, 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 don't I, I don't think there's many shows that you could look back through the, the history of theatre and go that like Les Mis was so close to being closed and yeah. it became what it became. So the idea that hits 20 years down the track were always going to be hits. Mm. I, I, I mean, cat, like cats is the most unlikely hit of all time. Like there's, there's uh. nothing, 
about that show that goes, this is going to be a commercial success. And so, Asia loves it. So, still touring and in Asia. Asia still loves it. Um, <laughs> not the film, but, 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 um, but, uh, but you know, as it's so easy to rewrite history when things become that popular and to assume yeah. that Wicked was always going to be what we, Wicked became and that, that, you know, Phantom was always going to become, you know, that's not how it works, you know. Mm. And certainly having watched it close proximity, Dear Evan Hansen and Come From Away and that, that era of shows become what they have become. Mm. Uh, it's an amazing thing watching a show erupt into life and find its audience. And it's a depressing thing on the flip side when really good shows don't do that. And, mm. and it works both ways. You know, like some, some really, really, some of my favourite shows are viewed as commercial flops and are barely seen. Some shows that I think are not very good become commercial hits and then you get this sweet spot with something like Come From Away or Evan Hansen where you go, it's a great show and it became a hit. Um, yeah. But it was certainly not a guarantee in the weeks that those shows were previewing because I saw both of them in around that era and I spoke to the producers and the, there was no guarantee that those shows were becoming what they became. Yeah. And it's it's interesting too because Come From Away is going to Australia soon too, right? Uh, it's already been in Australia. It was impacted again by COVID, but they've just mm. announced that they're that they're, they're reopening in, I think it's uh, Sydney and Brisbane or something like that. Right. And it's interesting that those sort of, you know, like Hamilton and Come For Away, that it definitely have a very American resonance because of its story is, is resonating um, around the world as well. Is it? Does that happen in reverse? Is there stuff that has come from Australia or the uh, UK that's made it big on Broadway? Well, the UK definitely. So the UK has had Billy Elliot and Matilda. Yeah, of course. Know, even though Tim Minchin composed it. Um, so the UK has had a, a long history of bringing shows over to Broadway. Australia really hasn't, uh, and certainly not shows with original scores. So, you know, A Boy From Oz played on Broadway. Priscilla has toured around. But they, they at the heart of them, had, were, were catalogued pop musicals that had existing music. Mm. Uh, so for me, I think what excites me over the next five to ten years, and I think it's coming, is shows that are written in Australia that that can go and Make take on Broadway. the world uh, that have an original score. Yeah, and mm. and I and I don't I don't think it's um in the same way that you know you have Les Mis, which is set in France and written by a Frenchman that can play London and can play. I don't think you actually need to change your location I, I, one problem that australia always has is that the minute we have the australian accent in a show uh people in america love trying to do the american uh, the australian accent and they people in england love trying to do it but they're pretty bad at it so it's a hard <laughs> accent to do but, but the bigger problem than that is it becomes it becomes a bit of a novelty show like people stop seeing the actual writing of the show and just go yeah by it's writing and it's and it's characters and it's storyline and it sort of becomes the funny Australian. We love Australians and Australians do these funny accents. It becomes more about that than it does about. So when I did the hat pin, which is over a decade ago now, we, James Miller and Peter Rutherford, uh, I, I basically was with that show from about draft one. When we have licensed that around the world, that show is very specifically based on a true story that happened in Sydney. Um, mm. And after draft one that the boys sent me, I suggested then that, we remove the word Australia, we remove the word Sydney. So it still talks about suburbs of, of Sydney, like Stanmore and McDonald Town and all these things. And when you do it in an Australian accent, it feels very Australian. But the reality is that show can be done in London, has been done in London and the USA, where you don't change a word of the show, but you put it into the local accent. And people just assume that it's a story that was set in America or a story that was set in London. So mm. that even though I, I don't love the idea that you have to remove Australia as a bit as a, as a location, that is kind of how I structure most of the musicals I work on with writers in Australia saying, let it, let it go into another accent overseas. Don't specifically set it in the Australian accent because um, we will do, Australians can do English accents and American accents and we're used to importing all the time. The rest of the mm -hmm. world is not used to taking the Australian accent on stage and doing it very well. So Yeah. Not vice yeah. versa. <laughs> Do you have a favourite show that you've uh, produced? Uh, no, I have. I, no, not really. I mean, I tend to love most. There's, there's not many shows I produced. There's one or two that I didn't love at the time I was doing it. But I did that earlier in my career and I've got to a point where I went, I, I just will never do that again. Like, I've got to mm. love it to the point that mm. I want to do it. Um, and I don't really have a favourite show in the world. Like, I, I love a, a catalogue of shows that I think are my favourite shows that mm. shaped me at various 
points in my life and at different ages and for different reasons. So, so no, I don't really have one that I go, that's the thing I'm proud of. I mean, certainly the hat pin, the show I talked about a second ago, was a career-defining moment, and we managed to put a new Australian musical with dark themes and an original score mm. onto stage in Sydney, which at the time there, there had not been a new Australian musical on for quite a while before that of that scale. Um, and that has all changed since then. I'm not, I'm not saying that have been changed, but I think, you know, various things changed. But I'm, I'm always really proud of that show. And and it did. That was the one that started my phone ringing from everybody that had ever written a show in Australia that wanted it on. So, so yeah. it was, it, it, it was um, a really happy collaboration with the writers and the creative team. But it was more that it did sort of kickstart me in this pathway of going, well, I guess I, in Australia for a while, I was the guy that helps you get your Australian musical on, which is <laughs> not a commercially great idea, but it was really exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Call Neil, he'll make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, just if anyone wants to ask any questions, feel, please feel free. Everyone's being pretty quiet today. I think uh, you, you're flooding us with information, Neil, so it's very good. Um, I, I, t I tend to talk too fast all the time, so I, I do that with people. <laughs> no, I, will, no. I will try and slow myself down. No, it's all good. And so do you still want to do any writing like now that you're, um, you know, jetting around the world and being involved in so many uh, shows? Do you have the time for that? Uh, time is a bit of an issue, but it's more that I, I – so I wrote back to the 80s when I was 23, and I've written a show called Pop Star Sits, which is a 90s catalogue show. Um, my issue is I don't view myself as a writer, and, and while I um, – as I work with great writers in my producing and directing career, I look at what they do and I go, that's a writer and I'm mm. something else. The fact that I wrote Back to the 80s, which is I think it's the most licensed Australian show of all time, like in terms of the number of productions because it's just done by high schools all around the world, is kind yeah. of an irony. I mean, I'm really thankful for it. But um, <laughs> So, so I, I view myself as a writer in the sense that when I get an idea – I can put treatments down on paper and I can certainly write, but I, I tend to get to a point in time where I go, you want to work with the best people to get the best show. And I can think of 10 writers that are better than me off the top of my head for any project that I go, mm -hmm. I, I would be better off paying them, particularly for lyrics. I go, I, you know, I'm not a lyric writer at all. So I go, you know, why not get a better writer than me and a better lyricist and be a part of the, you know, I, I thought of this idea maybe and I've written a treatment and I want to guide it and but no, I, I just don't consider myself to be a writer. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're when you're producing a show and you're assembling a team, you know, you said you going back to your point where you're always trying to make sure it's a great team. And and how did you sort of cultivate that in terms of, I mean, because you you started making stuff pretty young, right? Yeah. So like, did you learn from mistakes or did you know from the outset you were trying to get a good team, you know? Now, early on, when, you, when you're young enough in this industry and particularly when you're doing things at, like, university theatres or, you know, in that phase where you don't have the pressures of... Although, don't get me wrong, like, the, the, for my first show, which was Assassins that I produced and directed, um, that probably had a budget of $20,000, which was huge money at the time. Like, you know, the, risk, the risk is proportional to the money you have. Um, yeah, but for that show, I mean, I, I look at that show and I go, that was the foundation of a career, not so much of anything we put on stage. Although I'm still pretty proud of it, but it was more that. Uh, so James Miller, that I mentioned, that wrote the hat pen, he was in Assassins, and it just happened right. to be a, a friend of mine. Uh, Luke Joslin, who is still one of my closest collaborators in the state, is now the resident director of Shrek in Australia and stuff. He was in that show. Um, my Jennifer White, who dialect coaches almost all of my shows now, she was in the cast of that show. So you have this really golden opportunity in your early 20s to just, whether, whether it's through Australian theatre for young people in Australia or just your local community theatre or, or like we did with Assassins, just to meet people and work out who you like working with and mm -hmm. identify people that you can look at even in their early 20s and go, well, right now we're kind of working uh, – you know, at restaurants and cafes and whatever we were doing then, but then go, I like hanging out with them at the pub and having a drink. They are really smart theatre brains and we're all in our early 20s, so who knows where we end up. But sometimes you can go, 
I feel like this is something that will last for the next 20 years and they will be, mm. you know, and that this group of kids sitting at a university theatre in their 20s will end up, I mean, if you look at that cast of Assassins now, it's, it's really extraordinary where everybody went. Like Richard Neville, that was the lighting designer on that show, now runs Mandy Lights. He's about to light drama queens for me. But he does the Backstreet Boys tours around the world. And so, so, so you kind of go, there's just these, it's, it's all about this web of, you know, people talk about, you know, connections and who you work with, but it really does come down to that. Like find people mm. you love collaborating with that are also really skilled. Like there's no point finding people you love that aren't good at their job. Yeah, but find people that are really good that you love working with that you get a shorthand with, you know, you know how each other thinks to some extent and hold that together for as long as you can, because you know it changes. People have little rifts or other people's careers take off and they're suddenly, they're not performing anymore. They're directing over there and they're too busy to come and do it. But that, that really is sort of how I view the history of when I do get the chance to look back now of going, it all started with very, very non cynical way. Cause I mean, the other thing that you hear, I see a lot now is that, 20 year olds are told to network and they're told and so people walk up and go hi i'm so and so we should know each other and you go that's not how it works it's, it's not just mm. like get in everybody's face and tell everybody what you do and tell them you're desperate to work with them because that that desperation like the, the team that i worked with on assassins we had no idea what we were going to do in the, the three months after that show let alone 20 years we just worked together liked each other and have kept connecting back to each other to to do new new work Mm. Um, so networking is not, I find is not as cynical and not as in your face car salesman as people are told it is. It, it really just comes down to socializing and doing things together, creating things together and liking each other. Mm. Yeah. Working together. Yeah. Um, it's funny that you said Richard Neville, cause I actually was speaking to him this morning. We're going to get him on for a podcast. So uh, oh, good, good, good. Yeah. We met many years ago in Las Vegas. Many, he reminded me, I, I forgot, but uh, yeah, we met many years ago. So it's good. I, I'm, I think it, that's like you said, when you've got a group of people and, and you, you connect with them, even if it's been many years, you, you know, you're still in the same networks and you're still in the same groups. So you come together to put yeah. these shows. It's, it's well, good. I, well he's, he's a great example because I think Richard was probably 15 or 16 when I did Assassins and he, and he did this great lighting play. He was always a bit of a boy wonder. For lighting, uh, particularly within Sydney Youth Musical Theatre and, and those companies in Western Sydney, um, and you know he was kind of the the the, the 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 junior on that show. And the reality now is with Drummer Queens, Richard's company is so big and he's so busy that I'm now the one sort of grovelling back, going, "Please come and do Drummer Queens with me." So, so you know, be nice to everybody because you, yeah. you never know. You never know when somebody that you can dismiss as this junior person that's an underling. Suddenly, yeah. it's the decision maker above you that you're suddenly going, okay, well, I need, I, they have all the power in this conversation. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and what's the long term plan for you? Are you going to sort of, you, you keep flitting from between Australia and New York, or, you know, you're going to sit Yeah, up I more... think so. Yeah, no, I, I, I will stay in New York for a while, I think. Um, I kind of need the world to open up and that allows me just to, to fly back, you know, for, for family reasons to Australia and, and for shows. <laughs> but, um, for the next couple of years, I think I'll follow the show. It's really so. So Drama Queens um, opens in Sydney in February and then is doing Melbourne, Brisbane before going on tour. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're going to be trying to roll that overseas into into Asia and into the US and, and Europe by 22, maybe to 23. So, so that show will kind of dictate where I am some of the time. Uh, obviously, when Back to the Future opens, I'll be going to London for a few weeks there. Um, when the show is winding up off Broadway here, I'll be back in New York for those months leading up to that. So, so I, I guess now I, I, I do be sort of hopefully have a bit of a luxury of going, I will just flit around between two or three, you know, amazing theater cities and then go where the work is for a little while. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you have a very blessed career, Neil. <laughs> well, well COVID, COVID has kind of squashed that completely, but uh, yeah. that, that's the plan. Let, let's see if it works out, but that's, that's the plan. Well, I wish you all the best and I thank you so much for chatting us, with us today. I really appreciate uh, your insight into COVID and also your career. So thank you so much for being with us today. Great. Thanks for the chat. Wonderful. Before we go, guys, I just want to show you some of our upcoming webinars. Uh, let me show you. We've got a 
some coming up tomorrow we're doing how do we maintain motivation and that's with a gang out of canada with some Cirque du Soleil people we're going to do a master class on going virtual with stage management that's with gareth hulance and that's on december 5. we're talking with blake from uh who worked on the biden campaign and we're going to talk political touring on the 7th of december and we're talking uh, game presentation and fan engagement with the LA Sparks, uh, the woman in the WNBA, uh, on December 14. And then we've got accessibility in theatre with the gang out of Ireland and the Smith Centre in Las Vegas. So we've got a huge lineup for December. So please sign up for us on Theatre Art Life on the website, and I hope you will join us. Neil, thanks again. We really appreciate having you, and uh, and I hope um, I see you in New York or Australia some, sometime soon. I would love that. I've just seen. Can I just very quickly address Jonathan Mann put a comment in the in the the group that I just wouldn't. Yeah, go for it quickly for two seconds. Um, so so hi Jonathan. He's basically talking about Fun Home, um, and saying that uh, it doesn't have a commercial audience everywhere, but talking about the fact in the UK that there's more of an interest in Black and Asian voices from publicly funded and commercial producers, but there's a struggle for East Asian Chinese uh, people in in work. Um, and he's asking about how that sits within Australia and New York. So, Jonathan, I, I think that's a really interesting point, particularly for Australia, because Australia is going through the same uh, discussions and the same ideological wrangling that, say, the USA is going through with Black Lives Matter and, and all the stuff here. Um, my view in Australia is that we have a slightly strange perception of our population makeup because we import Book of Mormon into Australia and we import African-American performers and because we inherit shows like Hamilton and in the Heights that have these Latino populations, whereas Australians, Latino and, and African-American population, they're really small, um, really valuable, but really small. My view is as Australia starts asking itself these questions, that we have to acknowledge that 17% of the Australian population is is Southeast Asian and and tw that's something like 22% in Sydney, I believe. So uh, my personal hope is particularly for things like the Hayes and all that, is that as, we, as we start tailoring our programs and like commissioning writers and, and, um, and you know, sourcing our directors and creative teams that, uh, yes, in Australia, to me, there's no doubt that our massively underrepresented population is our, is our, is our Asian population. Um, and because of our proximity to Asia and because of the, the immigration that's happened into Australia, I would hope personally over the next 10 years that Australia is one of the driving forces for the global theatre of, of, of producing shows and creating shows that, that, that come from the, the, you know, the storytelling of the, of the Asian community and, and created by the Asian community. Uh, I think we're perfectly positioned to do that and then to export those shows to the world. Um, and that's a factor of our population. So, so like I said, we, we have to sort of get through our confusion at the moment of always discussing whether African-American roles should be imported from the USA or not um, and focus down onto our true population. So I hope that answers some of that question. Sorry, Anna, to jump in like that. No, no, I really appreciate you you answering that question. I think it's really important. And, uh, you know, that diversity, hopefully, yeah, we, we work towards that more and more in Australia and across the globe. So I, I like your outlook yeah. and, and hopefully... Yeah, I think, if you've I think got, diversity if, is vital everywhere. But if it's yeah. just that diversity, the, the diversity question in the USA is, is a different question from diversity in Australia, is different from diversity in the UK because we all have different population makeups. So. Mm -hmm. Even here but in Hong have, Kong. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And when you have the same shows going around the world, it does create a bit of confusion about what each country's actual population is made up of. So. Yeah, and where that representation sits and lies, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks again, for Neil, for your time. And, uh, yeah, hopefully we'll see you in the future again soon. Thank you very much, Anna. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Bye.